Hi, yeah. everyone. We have joined with delay, and that was my mistake as the moderators that connected with the wrong email. So uh, <laughs> good to everyone here. I think we have 10 people with us, if I'm looking at the top of the screen, and so it looks like we are in. So I will shorten a little bit the introduction, since everyone has read the introductions, and we have five amazing speakers. So I wouldn't wish to take the best of their times. Uh, we have prepared a conversation script to reflect on the pandemics and the COVID around the two main questions that was asked by uh, the organizers uh, on the response to the crisis. And the first one is to reflect about the role of governments and philanthropy. And the second one is to reflect on the connections with the pandemics and uh, the growing inequality. We have five speakers. I won't, introduce, I won't introduce them to you because I think everyone can get connected in two days. Uh, and since I want to go directly to the topic without sport ado, I'll start with you, Marcello, uh, as the founder of the platform Wisdom Accelerators. Uh, you hear many voices in the work you do with the platforms. And I'll be tempted before we go into the specific questions to give us some insight or what has evolved the last 12 months from your perspective as you observe the scene of philanthropy? Right. No, thanks again for organizing it, Tian. It's amazing to have you um, moderating the session. Thanks to all the other participants. Uh, when it comes to Wisdom Accelerator, what we're trying to do is to act as catalysts, right? So we're trying to help people help themselves. And the way it's structured is that everybody who joins a community somehow as a speaker, as a volunteer, and above all, as a teenager, should benefit from that uh, with a long-term perspective. So usually what I say is that we're not a corporation. We don't think in terms of quarters of a year. We think in terms of quarters of a century, which you can also define as a generation, right? And the one thing that impressed me uh, recently that I, I just haven't realized that after Gen Z, you have Gen A, and the Gen A's, they're already 10, 11 years old right now. Right? So I, we started creating a platform that is very long-term that allows them to focus on philanthropic action, to make certain decisions in their life. And um, that is going to give them the credibility to be able to take action as quickly as possible. So we're inviting uh, hundreds, literally, of uh, speakers that had more than 300 so far. Peter was a speaker and had a great session. Uh, we tried to invite them from all around the world. So we're close to 100 countries represented already. And you no, know, very few events around the world, other than the Olympic Games and sports competitions, have 100 countries being represented. And the uh, voices that we've been hearing, they um, just by the fact that they're participating, they're donating, they're, they're being philanthropic with their time. They're not, not giving us money, they're just giving time and effort because they want to share those experiences. I mean, Peter had a, an amazing story that is going to resonate with so many teenagers. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, if they have uh, interest in following a similar career track, they come from the same country, uh, they just feel that uh, Peter is someone who could be a, a model for their lives. Now this is registered, right? And uh, they uh, can leverage that in the future as so, well. Now, yeah. the, I don't Thank, thank you. Before. So, no, no. So, what you're saying that the Gen A is uh, what you have seen emerging as the promises, and and it's where we should focus some of our attentions. And you're right. It's the beginning of an alphabet. Is already the beginning of a stories. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like, if I may, Marcello, to go also to uh, Bo from the Lego Foundations. And uh, when we were preparing the conversation, I was very impressed by some some of the early measure that uh, you took in responding to the crisis 12 months ago as the Lego Foundations. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what key decision have you taken as the Lego foundations uh, facing the pandemics and elaborate a little bit how Lego approach actually its philanthropic in, in, in its approach in few words. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting the session here and, and welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, our focus in the foundation is uh, systems change to bring on a different skill set for, for children, young people that are more like creativity and critical thinking uh, and uh, collaboration, so it's transitioning of the educational system. But it's a little difficult when we came into the COVID-19 crisis in terms of how to navigate that space. So the key thing we did as soon as the crisis hit was we actually remobilized all of our employees into action streams instead. Instead of working in our traditional initiatives and with our traditional partner work, we reoriented it into action streams that had immediate response. And the three key things that we did was, first, we focused on immediate support so immediate support is obviously the strength of philanthropy and humanitarian crisis systems. So 
emergency response, but also response to our partners because they have particular challenges of uh, the operating mechanisms, the delivery and the support and so forth. So immediate support is what I think philanthropies often do the best and, 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 uh, and fast. The second one was to open up a new area of innovation because what we saw was that there was a particular ways we had to engage our partners and audiences in a new ways. So first on, on parents, not only uh, uh, campaigns and, and other ways of reaching parents, but we mobilized our research and our examples and developed learning activities, which we equipped in an online playlist. And then we uh, equipped our partners to, to gradually improve that with video examples and guides. And the other part of innovation was to find new ways to support teachers to use technologies for uh, remote learning. So we compiled the evidence, we developed guides and so forth to teach So we had to innovate new ways of delivering our knowledge and, and mobilize our partners. And finally, I think what we have kept doing, which I think is important, is to keep focusing on the long-term outcomes. So while we can respond very fast and we can innovate new ideas, the key thing for us is to have lasting, sustainable and significant impact. But what's different is that we actually keep that outcome but our partners and, uh, and local uh, communities can define the activities and outputs as they like. So they can adjust the outputs and out, uh, outcomes as long as we keep the trajectory towards uh, the ultimate impact. And what we did was to develop a learning agenda that was much more agile. So asking questions all the time in terms of what works, uh, how can we improve, and how can we have similar questions across our partners. So the immediate support, the innovation, and then a much more agile, test, build, learn approach in, in reaching our outcomes. Bo, thank you. Um, if I can take 10 more seconds of your uh, reflections. I think you've been very humbling by describing what you do, but not the size of what you did. I was very impressed by the decision of the board on your side to give more. And uh, very often people say philanthropy is not a luxury good. It's something you have to act even more when things get hectic. Can you give us some size of, of the decision that the board decided to do more than usual in terms of size of grant making? Yeah, I think what we uh, really appreciate about our board, they have a lot of trust. and thoughts, uh, and I think that's uh, that's something that we have available, obviously, uh, but it is really building on not only the trust of the board, but also some great partners who who know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a, an ecosystem of a partnership mindset uh, between a foundation and its partners. Um, that was a very good introduction, so new gen and uh, risky and short-term response, so thank you to Bo and to Marcello. I'd like to go now in the reflections of the first question that was asked to us, is to reflect actually um, to which extent is philanthropy stepping on the foot of the governments when it does act and it does do things? And uh, there is a controversy. Are the philanthropy doing what the state should be doing or is it doing, doing what the state isn't doing? Uh, Andre, you are based in uh, South Africa and you have uh, another view while we are somehow, somehow all speaking for the US audience, but also for a broader audience. I'd be interested to hear from your experience uh, working with uh, early childhood educations and what is your relationship relationship in what you do with what the government does or should do it would be good to hear your experience. Can you share us a little bit around that? You should put your microphone. I think your microphone is off. I did it twice, sorry. Uh, thanks, Etienne, and welcome, everybody. So the importance, you know, the, the construct of government being able to deliver uh, in certain countries and under certain conditions becomes almost impossible based on historical criteria, et cetera. So we found ourselves in the South African context facing the shattered ECD system prior to and the post the, the pandemic, the, the circumstances deepened in, in its uh, severity. It's really a very, very bad system. So what we've <clears throat> undertaken, I just actually, funny enough, yesterday I had a presentation here in, in the region where the Minister of Social Development from the region was with us. And she basically was so bold and excited to say that what she listened was, in fact, like a blueprint for ECD. So what we've done over the past five years is create an ecosystem of trainers and teachers using AMI, which is Association Montessori International, based in the Netherlands. And we're opting to use the world's best Montessori standard to reach the communities most in need. And so the construct for us is we haven't planned to do this for government, but it's clearly becoming apparent that what we're trying to do is establish with philanthropy a base 
that at some point can actually be absorbed into a government infrastructure and utilized for growth. So for us, it's, it's very important. We can't tolerate to say, well, is it a good idea or not a good idea? We realize it's an essential. And as we travel through the regions and as we do the work we do, we know that it's absolutely vital. So in a sense, we're trying to create the Cambridge of ECD using the AMI model. And so far, the construct is quick. The effects are very, very quick. And what we're doing is really creating these community shapers. And they're people that are aware of the nutrition of the child, the well-being of the child, and educational construct, because it's about, it's about social justice in essence, which is what the pandemic has exposed. And so education systems, are, my worldview is, without early childhood being properly constructed, tertiary education is, is, can never be truly successful. And so at this point in time, we're trying to weave a new foundation for ECD, and certainly in the Western Cape, but in South Africa as a whole. And whilst government has not done a particularly good job, we would like to use the power that we have to create a platform and then join hands with government to try and do this collectively. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a combination, if I can say it, that. And I think it's up to us to maybe lead the charge, but it's up to us to lead a partnership charge as opposed to trying to do what government is supposed to do. So it's uh, you're, somehow you're, what you're saying in ECB, which is uh, the field of uh, expertise and where you operate, is uh, being rather subsidiary or innovators, but always in the mindset working with governments. Because, the gov I mean, that's, do I understand it right? Working in partnership, but also acting where the government might not be yet, but m leading the government to be more active, as you strongly believe that ECB is crucial to our development. Is that correct? Or? That, that is correct. Yeah. So ultimately, up until yesterday, government recently did not know for five years what has been unfolding. So when they came into this ecosystem, I did a full presentation. They, met, they, they were kind of blown away because they haven't had the time in the construct. Plus, in this particular construct, the Department of Education and Department of Social Development have both 50% holding of ECD. So you can just imagine when two government departments are sort of half handling two components, it, it has not succeeded to the extent that it could have. So we're not trying to do their job, but I think our, our work is inspirational And our work should show, showcase best in quality class. And we think that that's the way forward for every child. And so we're trying to put this uh, on the ground now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your insight. And uh, I look forward also for the other speaker to join if, if they wish to, you know, uh, bounce on one of the comments made by one of you. It's a, a conversation mindset. Uh, since I know see no raised hands, I'll go to Peter's. Peter, you lead the um, Other Dot Foundations and you let us know a little bit more what the Other Dot Foundation. But I was struck when I was talking to you, your appetite to offer voice to the voiceless. Uh, as we reflect on, on collaboration with government, but also in the mindset of the pandemics and what individuals have led as generosity and initiative. We have seen so many expression of it. I've seen also the bright side of the pandemics. Can you let us know at the Other Dot Foundation what you have seen around the pandemic in the last 12 months and where you see actually your roles connecting, you know, donors and, and, profit and, and good organizations or good initiative on the ground? Yeah, sure. I, I, again, uh, thank you for, uh, for the opportunity. Um, great to be here and, and hello to everyone. Um, You know, what, what's been interesting for me, and I, I tend to look at things in a completely different way. Um, and for me, I just see um, everyone's trying to do good, which is fantastic. But there's so much disjointedness around. Um, and at other dots, what we're trying to do is look at things from a different lens. And I truly believe that, that you know, the opportunity that we have is – It doesn't make sense for everyone just trying to, you know, give their philanthropic donation to one particular charity to another or whatever and just, and just split it all the way because it becomes diluted. So what are other dots we're trying to do is we have this, 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 I call it a global experiment and it's a global experiment of one, one dollar donations, literally one dollar donations and one voice. And what I mean by that is that if you can pull one dollar donations into a central hub that becomes that one reduces and lowers the risk of where that money goes to somewhere but what it does it becomes very powerful and very powerful in the sense that it can go to where it really needs to go to um and what it also can do it creates this what i call 100 trust and transparency which is so missing today And part of the global experiment that we're trying to do at Other Dots is about resetting the donations model. It's about making sure that everyone really understands where their money goes. And today it's so needed, absolutely so needed. 
Um, so what we're doing is reaching out to everybody and we're asking for everybody. And, and, our, and our global experiment is also about reaching out to a billion people, by the way. Now, it's an audacious, audacious and ambitious um, uh, global experiment. But the point being is that if we can get a billion voices and I'm not saying you're going to get a billion dollars, but all we're asking for is for everybody to donate their one dollar, which goes into this I call a pot that can then be directed towards funding the untapped potential, funding breakthroughs that will make the most impact uh, in saving the planet. But at the same time, donating that money to the trusted partners of the UNDP, for example, but only, only if they sit on a trusted engine so that every donor can understand where their money's been, go, where it's going, how much it's going and for what for. What for. And, you know, the, the issues, the global issues around today is all about educating for the future. It's all about trying to avert climate change. But to me, what's also important is making sure that no one gets left behind. And so now imagine that power of that one dollar. Everyone puts it into this one bucket and we can direct it to these channels, to those on the ground trying to solve these problems. So from a philanthropic, pers- philanthropic perspective, I think all of us can do our part. And if you think about corporates today with their CSR programs, switch the mindset now. All you need is one dollar from everybody. And all of a sudden now you've got this powerful movement. You've got this great opportunity that you're doing good. And we're doing good. We're making impact. But at the same time, we're being able to measure the outcomes. And we all can be a part of that rather than waiting for governments to make decisions which, you know, are bottlenecks in some respect and limit us to what we can and can't do. So that's, um, for me, where, where we're heading with other dots. And, you know, I, I'm very passionate, as you know from this. We spoke about this last time. I'm absolutely passionate about um, what we're trying to do and how we're doing this. And, and you know what? With COVID, by the way, it was COVID that sort of drove this pivot. Because um, for me, it's all about always about giving data a voice. And what I mean by that is reaching out to the untapped potential who don't have these opportunities to be here today listening to us to give them the opportunity, give them a voice so that we can do something good in the world. Yeah. Peter, um, in the work at, of Other Dot Foundation, would you have an illustration around the COVID response? I mean, that, that's also, I mean, the title of our session is the philanthropic yeah. response to the pandemic. Would you have uh, in 30 seconds uh, uh, an il- illustration of one collaboration where you said that where the money was well spent and, and, and I like that. I like to illustrate that. Well, for me, it's uh, we're struggling right now with vaccines. So one way of doing it is making sure that vaccines go to the developing world. And we can do that together, each of us. Okay. Put our money together to make that happen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's a big discussion around that. Um, Bo, um, you, you, you described before to us how you approach philanthropy. And uh, I'd like to go back to you uh, because I want that first question to be quite specific also with one illustration. Uh, I was impressed, and you describe it again, the way uh, your foundation is open to take risk. Uh, could you give us an illustration uh, related potentially to, to the pandemics where you felt that actually you could take a greater risk that government could have done otherwise and therefore the Lego Foundation could play, you know, the best on this edge? Could you bring us an illustration? Or if someone else of you might want to stress that, I'm also a, a taker on that question. Yeah, I can certainly start with, yeah. a, with an example. Um, I'd say certainly... On, on Peter's point also, I think COVID-19 have given opportunity to pivot many of the things we're dealing with, particularly educational systems. Like we came out of educational systems that failed to support systems and even basic skills, which were at that point academic. But now we know the basics are social, emotional, and we need creativity to reorientate towards different solutions. And children just didn't enjoy learning. So so COVID-19 have, have great opportunities to rethink the mindset. I want to emphasize also that all of this work we do is actually in, in collaboration with governments and for two main reasons, because the first one is that the, the, the governments have the overview of the support system we operate in, whether it's health or humanitarian or education, but all, all, also in most places, they are still the public voice. Uh, they are ambassador for the public voice. But, but that's kind of also where we need to take risks, uh, because if you want to take a long-term perspective, that's very difficult many times for the government so what we do 
when we think about risk taking, it's not you know not risking lives and it's not risking property and so forth, but it's funding innovative solutions that allow us to change the educational systems and the barriers we foresee. So barriers could be let's change the student assessments and find new ways to think about the chil- what children develop, the portfolios, the social emotional, and and not rely only on the standardized assessments. But what are new innovative ways of doing teacher training? Which is not only doing uh, the public teacher teacher training system. Uh, or what are alternative uh, materials and technologies one can use? So as soon as one deal with barriers in in the system that will allow the system to change in different ways, it is a little bit you know on what governments usually can do, and usually when it's long term. So we invest in long term, we invest in research, which is also quite you know risky because you don't know what you get out of it, you don't know what scenarios you provide. Uh, but also you we have a different donation model, so we have a very flexible donation model where you can. Support events. We can also quickly support uh, quick ideas based on shared mindset with partners, and we can do large-scale, multi-year framework grants where we have shared ideas, shared outcomes, and understanding of quality. So, so I think right now, finding what are the key opportunities slash barriers in the system that we can help test out is what we have been have been working on. Thank you both for that example. Uh, and uh, I feel quite the same because we have a lady on stage with us and she's the last one that's going to speak. So I was really unorganized uh, and I was reflecting about the conversation rather than actually any gentle manners. And Pial, I think uh, you would, but you would be best suited to help us to answer the second key questions in the last uh, third of our conversations uh, this, mo- that, this early afternoon in the US, I guess, uh, which is the question that is posed to us is how much is philanthropy address in Quality uh, that has so much increased during the recent crisis, uh, and uh, you you brought to me uh, what you feel as a new trend in that conversation is what you call the unusual collaboration, so the unusual partnership, if I may take. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by unusual partnerships and how they might help concretely to reduce inequality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So great conversation so far. So thank you to Horasis and to you, Tan, for convening such a great panel. So um, in terms of the role of philanthropy and looking at inequality, you know, it's so much more critical now than ever before. I think we've seen accelerated rates of inequality because of the pandemic. And if you think about inequality, you know, we've always been oriented around income inequality. But I think now we see that actually inequality is multifaceted. So we're looking not only at income inequality, we're looking at information inequality. And I think what really the the pandemic brought to the forefront was digital inequality. You know, we saw a mass acceleration to digital and those who weren't part of the digital economy were further left behind. And so the scale of the problem, the scale of the inequality is what is requiring unusual partnerships. And really what I mean by that is we can't do business as usual. We can't have transactional relationships. I sit within um, something called the Center for Inclusive Growth, which is the philanthropic hub of MasterCard. While we have philanthropic dollars, we also try to leverage the assets of the company to catalyze social impact. And so when I'm talking about moving from transactional partnerships to transformational partnerships, what I'm talking about is how do we go from just writing checks to writing checks plus bringing to bear the full power of all of our assets. So that could be MasterCard's technology, that could be our network, it could be our partners, it could be our our GDPR compliant data. And so as we're thinking about unusual partnerships, what we need to think about is actually how do you bring to bear all of the assets you have? And one of the things I've been really championing, Etienne, is how do private entities actually partner with other private entities? So this idea of private-private partnerships for the sake of social impact. And I can give you a few examples if if we have time at some point. But Take one. Okay, I'll take one minute. So, yes. so no, one really, example. Take one yeah. example. I think it make it very concrete for the. Okay, people. so I'll take an example. Um, so we have a partnership with Levi's, where the women who are garment workers, eighty five percent of garment workers are women, are getting paid in cash. That is really challenging for the factory owner. It's really challenging for the women. It creates. Um, unequal outcomes when it comes to women's economic empowerment. And of course, there's gender-based violence issues because they're walking home with large chunks of cash. So we partnered with Levi's. We partnered with Levi's, the company, Levi's, the foundation, MasterCard, the company, MasterCard, the Center for Inclusive Growth. So these four parties 
brought together. And what we did is we digitized the wages of the garment workers. So on the commercial end, MasterCard did the digitization of the payroll. On Levi's end, they were the ones that um, provided the introductions to the factory workers and the validation. And then on the center end, we provided education, cultural, social um, education to make sure that women had agency over their assets. They had the digital literacy, they had the financial literacy. And then the Levi's Foundation provided assets to make sure that the women understood how to use mobile wallets. And so four party model where we brought together all of our different assets to bring about better outcomes for women, better financial security and better women's economic empowerment. Convincing example. Thank you, Payal. Andre, uh, when we spoke, I was impressed the way that actually, uh, and you are both acting as a philanthropist, but also an entrepreneur. And um, there is a broad conversation now about, uh, and we've seen recently the move around Danone and what CEO can change or can't change. Uh, I was very impressed the way you describe um, the way business has a role to take, which is community. Can, us, can you let, share a little bit your personal experience about, you know, behaving as a company, having a responsibly needs community at your level to complement the market? MasterCard example, possibly. Uh, certainly, thank you, Etienne. So we, we, I have for 30 years run a business in the US. We're the largest importer of South African wines uh, into the US, and we've obviously been a large player in this trade in South Africa. I've always watched and witnessed. Firstly, by the way, we in talk to, in terms of inequality, we have the highest Gini coefficient in the world, uh, not far from where I live. Um, it's a, it's a devastating situation. We have a close to 40 percent unemployment, and this wine industry is about a $3 billion industry employing almost 300,000 people. Um, our work with the teacher training, we realized that the wine industry is a perfect uh, partner. So we're, I announced this yesterday at a session to the entire industry that we're proposing a new seal. We currently have a sustainability seal. We're going to tack onto that seal a social educational sustainability seal using ECD as a currency. So each winery or wineries or producers will be able to assess using the accreditation model that we've created They'll be able to have a, an ECD center accredited to the Department of Social Development Standards, which we will assist with. And the wineries and the commercial partners in each region will support this initiative because what they can then do is to sell a bottle of wine in Denmark, for example, the QR code will take you to with a seal that indicates that you're a partner to this. It'll take you to the region. It'll take you to the school. It'll show you accreditations. It'll show you infrastructure, materials. So we, we feel very strongly. It was very, very well received yesterday because the industry, as you might recall, in South Africa, there was a lockdown and a ban on actual alcohol and wine sales, which impacted the industry with billions of rands and dollars. So for us, it's really taking to the extreme. And, and I think it's one of the first initiatives in the world that will take such a large agricultural organization and actually embed that into the needs of the community entirely, starting with the child. And that's that's for us. It, it's a it's a perfect partner, private sort of a partnership uh, with with commerce and philanthropy. Um, and I think within six months, this model will be live. Um, and so it was a, it was a great launch yesterday. The industry was extremely uh, overwhelmed by what the possibility is. And I said it would be a couple of great great examples of marketing in the world too to show what we are doing. A lot of people spend money, but they're not highlighting what they do. And so this would give them an opportunity to do that. Payal, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that we reframe the conversation from corporate social responsibility to corporate social opportunity, right? Just as there is, in Andre's example, here is an opportunity for differentiation for, for these wines to say, not only am I buying a good bottle of South African wine, but I'm also giving back to early childhood development. In the MasterCard example, we're yes, we're helping women and driving women's economic empowerment, but we're also bringing them into the digital economy and they're transacting on MasterCard rails and on MasterCard um, products. And so so I do think as we think about the pandemic, as we think about the need for an inclusive economic recovery, we also have to think about that there's opportunity in the challenge on a commercial level so that it's actually going to lead to commercially sustainable social you're stealing Absolutely. my closing. You're stealing my closing comments, but I'll go back to you on the closing comments. I want to give a chance also to Marcello to come one back in the conversations. I mean, we've spoken about inequality in absolute terms between rich or poor, or between access to information. I mean, you came with a very strong view that the younger generation, the gen, has a, a, as an opinion below eleven years old. Um, 
what are the costs of the pandemic to the new generations? And where do you see actually, uh, 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 where do you see eventually the cost of, of, of that emerging from the COVID? I mean, what's your feel? I mean, you speak to new, next gen regularly. So can you give us a sense in the context of the pandemics with your own experience? Uh, but one minute, because I, I've came late and I need to be too tight on timing because of my delay. Sorry for, for our participants. You will need the microphone, Marcello. Sorry for that. Uh, I'll yeah. be brief. Um, basically, the younger kids learn most from the parents and siblings. Teenagers learn most from the community and friends at school, right? So they're really suffering a lot. And as we mentioned during our one-to-one uh, -one chat, when you can't travel far, you should travel deep, right? So I'm really hoping that they're using this uh, break, which is obviously the first time uh, in their lives and hopefully the last that are going to be uh, isolated for so long to try to reflect on what they want to do next. And um, the uh, links with other teenagers from uh, similar backgrounds and uh, with a similar sense of purpose is really, really important. So the uh, philanthropic response to the pandemic in this case should be enabling the enablers, right? Just to make a very, very quick point to uh, topics mentioned before. I think that uh, foundations and the family offices, people with means to help financially, they should really try to act as angel investors. They should be the venture capitalists of uh, doing good so that uh, certain models can be proven. And then you get governments involved because uh, governments tend to be very risk averse. They tend to operate in four or five year cycles. So the role of philanthropy here really is to make sure that teenagers, youth, or even older people who are trying to help the local communities, they are allowed to make the best decisions and then try to facilitate the process for bigger and better opportunities in the future. So, hopefully that was a minute. Yeah, I think I'll... No, thank you. That was a, a, an intense and a deep minute as you let us know that we should go in depth instead of on breath. So thanks, Marcello. Uh, we're getting closer to the end, but uh, I think I'll take, because I'm not sure sir, if I stop the streaming or the streaming will get stopped by itself. So I'll take my chance and I'd like to ask to start with Peters because uh, he, he had only once the chance uh, to share with us uh, his insight. Uh, we have understood from our conversation that the world is complex and that it's not easy to reduce, you know, who will make the difference. We've heard that the foundation can make a bigger difference uh, by moving fast and smartly in partnership than others can lead the way in business or that citizens can create a difference or the generations can make the difference. Can you give us to the audience one innovation or one thing that you have come through the last 12 months crisis, because I think we'll end up by saying that there is no post-COVID, there is only a during COVID. We'll probably live with COVID for quite some time. So what is the one innovation or the one thing that you have learned in the last 12 months that you would like to share with the audience? And if this is not the learning, it might be a hope. So Peters, the floor is for you first. Okay, thank you. I, I think two, two parts to it. First of all, the the uh, the video of our Abadots website was done by twelve year olds. That just demonstrates the uh, the thinking behind Generation A. By the way, tremendous. The second part for me, um, I think what the COVID has taught us and what is teaching us right now is that um, education needs to change the way the model works. Okay, so for me, it's all about creating education in an augmented world that that uses digital, but we do it in a way that everybody is connected for education it's got to be the foundation moving forward so that's my my you know, you know uh, point on those things there thank you that's very insightful i think we've been speaking education andre would you like to go next since we're getting closer certainly Adrian. i think the honesty is um early childhood has never taken its rightful place over the last century or two in the world of education and I think the pandemic has created a blue ocean for that. The decimation of the environment has created a real opportunity for us in the market to say it's time to frame this. So one of the projects I'm working on will be the first university of the child dedicated to uh, obviously women's empowerment in teacher training, but dedicated to the study of the child, both in play, in constructing health and wellness. But I think that's the most important thing is for me, we have to look to maternal health and the child in the next construct. It's essential. So it's almost a call for you after playing about youth and playing uh, what will be your insight at the Lego Foundations. I don't need to say more. These are fantastic ideas. Thank you for sharing them. No, well, I, I'll say I think I've seen a greater, what you say, democratization of how the sector works. 
um, to develop ideas, to learn, to create solutions. What I mean is I've actually seen into much greater diversity and being much more curious about the world during COVID-19 because you really want to see what goes on and everyone on the same issues. But also through the screens, young people, families are invited in to discussions in a completely new way. So I think that's a, that's a, a new way of thinking about how we can test and try out partnerships and with community dialogues in, in, in greater degree. Thank you, Bo Pehal. Your insight of One One Innovations. Um, I would just say that I'm I'm excited that there has been more innovative philanthropy because of the pandemic. The scale of the pandemic, it, it, without doing it innovatively and differently, we're not going to be able to get to economic recovery. So I'm excited about the innovation. I'm also excited about the emphasis on learning. There has not been a collective desire to learn, but now we have to learn so we can leapfrog. We started with you, Marcello. We'll finish with you. What is your one learning? Well, the, the word learning from the session is that there are lots of really amazing people trying to do great work, and it's our duty to make sure that those messages get out there. And we try to get public relations people involved and uh, try to get the media to understand that these are messages that people need to learn because they're very positive, they're full of hope, and they should definitely uh, you know, uh, be supported as much as possible. Thank you. I think your time, our time is off. I don't know if you've seen that. I see we have 12 people still on boards. Uh, but I'll close with uh, one quick to one keywords of each of you. One words if you look at the next 12 months and you're looking at, at your works. It can be broader than philanthropy. What would be your one words to close the sessions? Uh, I would say inclusion. I would say reimagination.